You're watching Tag TV. Good evening. Welcome to South Asia Newsline. I'm Lepakshi Khurana. Here are the top stories we're tracking for you on Tuesday, the 19th of April. Indian PM Modi inaugurates WHO Global Centre for Traditional Medicine in Western Jamnagar. Blast hit boys' school in Afghan capital, several killed. And Sri Lankan fishermen struggle due to inflation as financial crisis worsens. And now for all the details, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Tuesday inaugurated WHO Global Centre for Traditional Medicine in Western Jamnagar in the presence of WHO Director General Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus and Mauritius Prime Minister Pravind Kumar Jagnaut as part of his three-day visit to his home state, Gujarat. Global Centre for Traditional Medicine will be the first and only global outpost centre for traditional medicine across the world and will emerge as an international hub of global wellness. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Tuesday laid the foundation stone of the World Health Organization Global Centre for Traditional Medicine at Jamnagar in pole-bound Western Gujarat state. WHO Director General Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus and Mauritius Prime Minister Pravin Kumar Jagannath were present at the ceremony. Prime Ministers of Bangladesh, Bhutan and Nepal also attended the inauguration ceremony via video conferencing. The Global Centre for Traditional Medicine will be the first and only global outpost centre for traditional medicine across the world. It will emerge as an international hub of global wellness. Calling India's traditional medicine system a holistic science of life, Prime Minister Narendra Modi said the WHO Global Centre will open the door of age of traditional medicine in the world. This partnership for the whole life बहुत बड़ी जिम्मेदारी के रूप में ले रहा है ये सेंटर दुनिया भर में फैली पारंपरिक चिकित्सा से सहयोग से दुनिया के लोगों को बेहतर मेडिकल सॉल्यूशंस देने में मदद करेगा पीएम मोदी इज ऑन अ थ्री डे विजिट टू हिज होम स्टेट गुजरात Earlier in the day, he dedicated to the nation a new dairy complex and potato processing plant at the other district. An auto and taxi drivers in Indian capital New Delhi held a strike for a second day on Tuesday over soaring gas and fuel prices and to demand revision of fares. While some of the protesting unions called off the strike by evening, those associated with cab aggregators said they will continue their agitation until the demands are met. Auto and Taxi Drivers' Unions in Indian capital New Delhi on Tuesday continued their protest for a second day over the hike in gas and fuel prices and demanded revision of fares under a government mechanism. Petrol is being sold at Rs 105.41, diesel at Rs 96.67 and CNG at nearly Rs 72 rupees in Delhi. The price hike has affected the livelihoods of the drivers as they struggle to meet daily expenses. हमारी मांग यह है मैडम हमारे पैसे बढ़ाए जाएं ओला उबेर वाले 18 घंटे ड्यूटी करते हैं बेचारों को गैस के पैसे भी नहीं मिल रहे हैं उनके भी पैसे नहीं बढ़ रहे हमारे भी नहीं बढ़ रहे टैक्सी वालों के भी नहीं बढ़ रहे अब मैडम बताओ हम कहां जाएं किराया पुराना चल रहा है वही चल रहा है लेकिन रेट मैडम डबल हो चुका है सवारी इस बात को नहीं मानती सवारी तो देखो सवारी की जगह अगर हम भी होंगे तो हम यही सोचेंगे कि कम से कम में हम घर पहुँच जाएँ The protest caused inconvenience to daily commuters who had to struggle to reach their destinations. Those booking a taxi or an auto through cab aggregators also saw a steep increase in fares. The strike was supposed to be for two days but those associated with cab aggregators said they will continue to protest until their demands are met. 
And in news from Afghanistan, three explosions rocked a high school in western Kabul on Tuesday, killing at least six people and injuring children, according to Afghan security and health officials. Many residents in the neighborhood belong to the Shia Hazara community, an ethnic and religious minority frequently targeted by Sunni militant groups, including Islamic State. There was no immediate claim of responsibility for the attack, which followed a lull in violence over the cold winter months and after foreign forces withdrew last year. The Taliban say they have secured the country since taking power in August, but international officials and analysts say that the risk of a resurgence in militancy remains and the Islamic State militant group has claimed several major attacks. In news from Pakistan, Pakistan's Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif's new cabinet was sworn in on Tuesday, more than a week after he was elected as the Prime Minister, after replacing ousted Premier Imran Khan. The cabinet has 31 federal ministers, three ministers of state and three advisors. Pakistan's new cabinet took their oaths in a ceremony presided by Senate Chairman Sadiq Santrani on Tuesday. The new cabinet, made up of allied political parties, was sworn in over a week after Pakistan's parliament elected Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif to replace ousted Premier Imran Khan. Sanjrani had earlier administered the oath to PM Shahbaz Sharif in President Arif Alvi's absence, who went on sick leave ahead of the inauguration. The cabinet has 31 federal ministers, three ministers of state and three advisers. The portfolios for the cabinet members in the first phase have not yet been announced. Reports suggest that the portfolios were finalized amid rumors of disagreements between the main parties of coalition, Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, Pakistan People's Party and Jamaat Ulema Islam Fazl. There is also speculation that Pakistan People's Party Chairman Bilawal Bhutto Zardari may be chosen as the foreign minister. Sharif's new government faces a number of policy challenges, in particular dealing with an economy in deep trouble. And more news from Pakistan. An anti-terrorism court in Pakistan sentenced six men to death on Monday in a mass trial for the mob lynching of a Sri Lankan manager of a clothes factory in Sialkot city. Scores of enraged workers had tortured and burned Sri Lankan national Priyanth Kumar last December over accusations of blasphemy, which a police official at the time linked to the removal of a poster with Islamic holy verses. The court reportedly also gave life sentences to nine people, five years jail to one and two years sentences to 72. Eight of those sentenced were juveniles, lynchings over accusations of blasphemy, a crime that can carry the death sentence, have been frequent in Muslim-majority Pakistan. Though Pakistan's judiciary still gives death penalties, they are rarely carried out given potential abolition under reforms linked to a trade agreement with the European Union. And moving on, the rising level of unemployment in Gilgit Baltistan continues to be a cause of worry for the locals. They claim the corrupt administration has completely ignored the tourism sector, which can be further developed to generate employment in the illegally occupied region. Gilgit Baltistan, known for its picturesque landscape, is home to some of the highest mountains worldwide and colorful lakes and is a potential tourism hub. However, locals lament the successive governments have so far ignored the tourism sector that can provide countless job opportunities to hundreds of youngsters who remain unemployed despite possessing high-level degrees. Poor road infrastructure and connectivity have kept even the domestic tourists away from the region over the years, they say. प्रोफेशनलिज्म की तरफ अगर लेके जाएं जैसे कि उनको उनको प्लेटफॉर्म्स जैसे मुहैया करें उनको ऑफिसेज जैसे दे जाएं गवर्नमेंट की तरफ से अगर थोड़ा सा उनको उनकी तरफ कर दे तो टूरिज्म का बिजनेस हब बढ़ जाएगा हमारे पास जमीनें हैं हमारे पास बहुत सारी चीजें हैं लेकिन अनफॉर्चूनेटली कोई अभी तक कोई अच्छा सा लोन भी मुहैया नहीं कर किया लोकल्स क्लेम दैट इफ द पाकिस्तान गवर्नमेंट हैड इंप्लीमेंटेड एडिक्वेट पॉलिसीज एंड प्लानिंग द टूरिज्म सेक्टर कुड हैव प्रोवाइडेड अ सिग्निफिकेंट बूस्ट टू द रीजंस इकॉनमी However, due to the apathy by the establishment, it has remained backwards and underdeveloped. In news from Sri Lanka, fishing industry has been hit hard by dire economic situation in Sri Lanka. In the fishing town of Negambo, fishermen struggle to stay afloat as people deal with skyrocketing prices, prolonged markets and shortages of medicine, fuel and other items.
After three weeks at sea, Anton Fernando tallies his sales of tuna and other fish on a dock in Negumbo, a fishing town in Sri Lanka where the country's financial crisis has darkened already murky waters. The mat does not look good for Fernando and his crew of four among the dozen gently bobbing trawlers. Each fisherman takes home 40,000 Sri Lankan rupees, that is 125 US dollars from their grueling expedition. <laughs> The island nation of 22 million people is battling its worst financial crisis since independence in 1948. As COVID-19, mismanaged government finances and ill-timed tax curbs sap dwindling foreign reserves. Last week, the central bank said it was suspending repayment on some of its foreign debt pending a restructure. In Negumbo, the fishermen struggle to stay afloat as people deal with skyrocketing prices, prolonged power cuts and shortages of medicine, fuel and other items. Fishing makes up just 1.3% of the Southeast Asian nation's economy, but it employs one-tenth of its people and helps feed far more. Fishermen. They are facing uh, severe difficulties because of the fuel prices are gone up, one thing. And the scarcity of the uh, 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 fuel in the, in the market and the uh, amount that they get also very less. Okay, 20 litres for the small boats uh, and diesel, it's really difficult because diesel is one of the uh, worst uh, affected thing in the market, so they affected. And the, uh, they need a lot of food go to the sea because they stay in the sea maybe one month or six weeks, so that the food price has gone up. Meanwhile, Sri Lanka's finance ministry said on Tuesday that the International Monetary Fund will consider providing quick financial assistance to debt burden Sri Lanka following representations by India. Earlier on Monday, President Gotabaya Rajpaksa acknowledged that he made mistakes that led to the country's worst economic crisis in decades and pledged to correct them. And the sale of vermicelli, popularly known as sevia, has shot up in India's northern Prayagraj town during the Islamic month of Ramadan. Vermicelli forms an intrinsic part of Ramadan meals as people prefer to eat it when they break their daily fast during the holy month. Workers in vermicelli selling shops in India's northern Prayagraj town are burning the midnight oil to make the Islamic holy month of Ramadan sweet for the revelers as believers throng shops to buy popular food items to break their fast. During Ramadan, Muslims do not take food or water from dawn to dusk. They eat sehri, a pre-dawn meal, and end the day with evening meal called iftar. Vermicelli, locally known as sevia, soaked in milk, is an important part of Ramadan meals as believers prefer to eat it when they break their fast. Oriental delicacies such as khajla and feni are also famous items in the menu. Manufacturers who start making the thin long noodles like delicacy days in advance said that the holy month commonly brings in brisk business. They get orders from across major cities and sometimes even abroad. Well, that's all we have for you from South Asia this evening. Now our viewers can watch the show on SouthAsianewsline.com. You can also visit us on Facebook.com slash SAsianewsline and follow us on Twitter at SAsianewsline. That's all in tonight's edition. We'll see you same time tomorrow. Good night. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.
Thank <laughs> you.